as I will say, the final in A2. Without further ado, I will now call for the Prime Minister to give the phrase of the motion to this House to meet the way to the everyone for being here today. Uh, so the model that Pam and I want to use in this round, which I'm going to talk about first, uh, is that we believe that modern Western liberal democracies should recognize the Dalai Lama as a religious leader. We don't want this to be a political statement. We don't want it to necessarily be about Tibetan autonomy. We, really, we want to recognize the Dalai Lama as a religious leader of a religious people. Uh, this is fundamentally distinct from recognizing Tibet as a political region. Then we also want to tell you that we think this is significant because it, it allows us to have high-level talks, conversations, and dialogue, uh, and we think that this is going to be beneficial. We think it allows for open discourse. So it's the case that some Western leaders are already meeting with the Dalai Lama in the status quo, but we think that this allows that sort of engagement to be an official recognition that allows it to enter into the sphere of discussion with China's official government, and we think that this sort of dis uh, discourse is distinct from what's happening. So first I'm going to talk about uh, why this is consistent with liberal principles. Then second I'm going to talk about how this puts pressure on China to change the way that they currently interact with Tibet. And then Pam's going to talk about how this creates stability. So first, sure. Madam, it doesn't matter if you think there's a distinction. The Chinese government is not going to interpret any distinction of this model and will interpret it as an attack on their own sovereignty. <laughs> No, no, no. There's a huge distinction between saying that we think, for example, that Tibet should have like ultimate sovereignty over its entire region, or that the Dalai Lama should become the political leader of that region. That's not what we're saying. Yeah. 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 We're saying that the Dalai Lama is a religious leader who should be openly recognized by these Western liberal governments. I think that's right. Okay, so first, why is this consistent with the liberal principles on which Western democracies are founded? So we, this is an explanation of why we believe on a normative level that this is the right action to take. So first we would tell you that we believe that these Western liberal governments are obligated to support marginalized religious groups, and we think that there are several reasons for this. First we would tell you that we think it's important to have, sort of, to allow individuals to have separate ideals and identities from uh, the majority populations in states. So why is this important? Because we think that religion is a fundamental part of how individuals self-actualize. Because we do believe that there's sort of a right to the good life. And furthermore, we believe that this right should not be limited by the lottery of birth. And we believe that's something that Western democracies have always believed in. But additionally, we would tell you that we think that the sorts of tensions we see in the status quo between China and Tibet, Tibet and in particular the sorts of human rights abuses that we've seen, have meaningful implications for the future of Tibet if we don't have Western liberal democracies taking a stand and saying that it's not okay to constantly oppress these people, that it's not okay to have military crackdowns where they're killed in the streets, that it's not acceptable to, uh, to fundamentally prevent them from having a sort of feeling of religious coherence in their community. And we do think that the lack of recognition of the Dalai Lama and, and the inability of the Dalai Lama to lead his people does have this impact. We think that when people aren't able to communicate with their religious leader, aren't able to have the freedom to interact with a religious leader as they see fit, that that prevents them from having a real relationship, not only with that religious leader, but with their faith as a whole. And we think that this is incredibly problematic. We additionally think, so we think that this specific cultural repression can lead to things like genocide. For example, right now, um, the, the Chinese government has flooded the region with Han Chinese in order to culturally dilute the area. And we think that that's the sort of thing that actually causes religions to die out, which we think is not only harmful for these, for these individuals currently, but we think is harmful for the way in which we view global diversity and these Western liberal principles of an individual right uh, to, to believe and to, to lead one's own life. And additionally, we think this is consistent with the protection of human rights, okay, which we think is an important thing uh, that, that Western liberal democracies recognize. Actually, thank you. Uh, if it's just a religion, and if it's just for religious purposes, how do you get any of the sentiments that you're now expressing? No, no, no. So we don't think this is about giving, giving the region like expanded political rights, but we do think it's about opening a dialogue, like I talked about in the initial model. 
We think it's about, uh, and we think that once we have that dialogue between Western liberal states and the Dalai Lama, we say these people have a right to practice their culture, to practice their religion, to be a legitimate part of the state of China. So we don't think it's necessarily the case that individuals need self-rule in order to derive all of these political benefits. We're talking more about quality of life benefits, like the ability to practice one's religion and the ability not to be killed in the streets of the area where one lives. But then the second thing I want to talk about is, so I think I've made it clear here that we would do this if we were within our, uh, we would do this if these peoples existed within, within the borders of Western liberal democracies. Um, but I want to talk now about why it's actually important in terms of international relations, why this actually puts pressure on China. So, so first I want to talk about the way in which the relationship between China and the West functions in the status quo. So we would tell you that right now, the relationship that liberal democracies and the West have forged with China is what we call a responsible stakeholder model. And what this means is that we believe that these, these countries, uh, the governments of these countries believe that they have to cooperate with one another because many of the issues that face the country, or that face the world currently, are the sorts of issues that necessitate global cooperation. These are things like climate change. These are things like the financial collapse. So we would tell you that we don't think that this is going to be the meaningful tipping point in relations between the West and China. That is to say, we don't think that this is going to be the point at which uh, China feels that it needs to cut off relationships with the West. Rather, what we would tell you is that we think there's enough capital because of this responsible stakeholder model to ensure that China recognizes that this is an initiation of dialogue uh, and, and not something that challenges the political rule of the Chinese state. But furthermore, we would tell you that, that we've seen in the past how international pressure can actually lead China to change their behavior. So we can look to everything that happened in 2008 in Tibet, how we saw protests in the Tibetan streets, how we saw a hard military crackdown that led to deaths of the Tibetan Buddhists, how we saw that the Olympics gave us the leverage to apply international pressure so that, uh, so that in April, we saw that the Chinese government actually agreed to have talks not with the Dalai Lama, but with representatives of the Dalai Lama. We think this is a significant example of why this isn't actually an issue, especially this religious recognition, isn't actually an issue that will lead China to antagonize its relations with the West, but rather will be a meaningful way to apply pressure. So because we think this is consistent with liberal principles, and because we think it effectively puts pressure on China in order to protect the Tibetan Buddhists, we are proud to propose. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. To get rid of the elephant uh, in, in the room, uh, or the dragon, so to speak, Speaker, the model that we've heard from side proposition ostensibly does nothing to anger China politically, but does everything to stop the political actions of China. Uh, absurd. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we would first of all posit that it is very difficult, uh, in the abstract sense, to recognize the Dalai Lama as the religious leader but not the political leader, because in a very important sense, those two are both constitutively intertwined in the Tibet region. So as far as the Tibet people are concerned, the region, there, is very, there is no differentiation between the two. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we'd like to point out that currently many nations, including the United States, have met with the Dalai Lama. We don't really understand what gains you get by recognizing him as a religious leader. I mean, it may help the Pope, uh, but it doesn't do much for any extra sort of dialogue that may be occurring. Uh, Mr. Speaker. So in that sense, I don't really see what gains you get. There was a lot of discussion of open dialogue that may emerge between parties. But none of that seems to be entailed from merely recognizing the leader as a religious leader on top of whatever recognition that has occurred already in Western liberal democracies in other nations around the world. Uh, I think that is a damning problem with their case. But what I would say is if for their case to have any, any sense of relevance, I think what they are ostensibly claiming is that it will matter in some significant sense to the Chinese government, that this will mean that they will somehow respect the people, with the Tibetan people and the Han Chinese people within uh, Tibet more and provide, perhaps provide greater recognition. If that is their claim, Mr. Speaker, regardless of how it is impossible to achieve it, we think that is also fundamentally problematic. And on that line, note, Mr. Speaker, we have three, uh, 
three points that I would like to present. First of all, I'd like to talk about what we see on our side as our model towards progress and towards better outcomes inside the Tibetan region. Secondly, I want to talk about uh, how we think this will actually increase violence against Tibetans. And thirdly, what implications we think this has for other minority groups inside China, uh, also bad things. Um, so first of all, as a model of progress, we've, we'd like to know, Mr. Speaker, that there actually has been some attempts towards integration currently, as it stands, uh, with, with the Tibetan people. Now, you know, they were right about, two, uh, actually in 2007, we saw investments uh, from the Chinese government in towards providing an airport. We oh, saw the 2002 invitation of the Tibetan people. Why does this matter, Mr. Speaker? Because what we think is possible under the Chinese uh, rule oh, is the idea of groups recognizing that they are part of the Chinese state uh, and that they will accept the rule of the Chinese state and at best may be uh, auton federated autonomous regions, for example, like Hong Kong and Macau, and not try and become independent like we saw happen in Taiwan. Uh, now, why does this matter, Mr. Speaker? Now, there's a couple ways I'd like to look at this. First of all, we think that the way the Chinese government maintains its authority and legitimacy in that region is based on its claim of being a central, uh, well, it's a communist state, right? They, they know what, what everyone in the state wants. Outside pressures telling them what should happen outside of that, I think, undermines part of that credibility. Furthermore, the recognition that there is a claim for independence, which is what they'd be suggesting, I think also undermines that in some important sense. Note, Mr. Speaker, that the Dalai Lama is considered a leader of an independent country in exile. Um, and I think what we offer, at least on our side, is without giving further pushes towards the sort of massive independence that I think is what Western recognition offers, it offers, uh, as we'll call regional stability later, I think is a problem in that sense. Now, finally, uh, next on to the, no thank you, madam, violence uh, against Tibetans. First thing I'd like to point out is that there is a significant Han Chinese uh, group within Tibet. Now, whether or not they came there for one reason or another doesn't change that they, they are there and doesn't change the high chances of violence that have occurred and do occur when there are significant moves for Tibetan independence in the region. Furthermore, I'd like to point out that military suppression of Tibetan moves for independence have always been forthcoming from the Chinese government. You need to look no further than 2001, where the Chinese uh, the ar army occupied the Tibetan monastery until they refused, they declined their uh, claim for independence, uh, or desire or demand for independence. I'll take you in a moment, madam. So what we think we have here is the example that there is a significant chance of violence that will happen against Tibetans within the region, first of all, from other Han Chinese uh, people there who are threatened by the possibilities of future prospects of independence uh, from the Chinese state. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, we think that this actually offers a threat to the Chinese central government. And when they have perceived those threats, what they often have responded with is a violent suppression. Because, uh, moreover, it's important to note that there is significant media control in the Tibetan region by the Chinese government. The ability for them to, first of all, act without Western governments being able to know what happens, and secondly, able to act without any sort of recourse from any group, Mr. Speaker, is highly strong and powerful. It means that often, as has happened in the past, when groups try to make claims for independence, which leads me to a third argument, that they often are uh, suppressed, repressed, and ultimately crushed. <coughs> the Dalai Lama has explicitly given up any claim to independence in order to try and secure autonomy. Why, therefore, do any of your arguments make sense? Okay, um, so. Your case has to provide at least the following things, right? You are arguing that there should be uh, some sort of a federation for the Tibetan people, as it currently stands. Now, what I'd like to point out is that Western recognition of the Dalai Lama uh, is actually part of a broader network, uh, a broader web, I guess, of politics involving the in claims of the Tibetan people to be an independent people, to be a unique people that ought to have some sort of autonomy. Now, that is very different from the Chinese government currently taking on policies of integration, where they, in fact, are the locus of change, where they, in fact, integrate them as they wish, and under the auspices of no future violence uh, or no future threats, will continue to do so. Now, the final thing I'd like to talk about is why we think this actually offers significant threats to other minority groups inside, uh, inside China. Because there are uh, violence, there is violence, and there is a sort of rise, well, from Guangzhou to uh, <coughs> Xinjiang, where we also see a Pakistani terrorist actually coming in and helping train those individuals there. And the tacit claim that's being expressed is that if you are to fight hard and long enough, uh, and if you are to have enough time for, for enough Western uh, states to recognize some leader, some part uh, of your group as having a legitimate claim, against the Chinese central authorities, that that will be supported internationally and that ideally that pressure will turn into a gain for your region. Now, why does that matter? Because if that's the case, then that is a great reason and that is a major reason why Chinese, the Chinese government uses the Chinese army to violently suppress these other minorities and these other regions. 
We think that so long as you have these sorts of claims of, uh, first of all, of, of independence in any sense from the Chinese state, and secondly, the way you have any claims of Western nations suggesting and demanding the control of different parts of China be delinked, changed outside of Chinese uh, central command, I think you undermine the legitimacy of the Chinese state, you undermine its ability to control the people, Mr. Speaker. We beg to oppose. We're honored to be here. Uh, I'm first going to start with, with one point of rebuttal and get into my extension about how this leads to greater stability in China and within the world, uh, and then get into some direct rebuttal. So we hear uh, these objections from opposition bench that, well, politics and religion are inevitably intertwined, and, and obviously the Chinese government will see this as the same thing, and, and, and how we aren't going far enough. Well, here's the problem. Uh, first, uh, there is a difference within the Tibetan people of, of the political arm and the Dalai Lama. Now, obviously, there are relationships between the two, but there is a parliament in exile of which the Dalai Lama is not a part of. In fact, uh, in fact, in 2004, I believe it was, there was literally a transfer of power where they said we're going to separate the political power and put more of that within uh, the, this parliament in exile and make the Dalai Lama more of a cultural and religious figure. And why is that? Because when you separate, we, they, they knew that that was a, a, a good move because when you separate those kinds of political and religious powers, that means more avenues are available for people to actualize themselves and for people to articulate their needs and for people to have representatives, especially when you have oppressed minorities, they have different avenues of, of representation. Now, here's why these nuances matter in international relations. In international relations, uh, especially when you've got a stakeholder model with, with, very, uh, kind of with, with, with actors such as China, uh, you need to proceed with baby steps. We can't have some kind of model where we're like, we're going to go in and bomb China until they recognize all of the rights of the Tibetan people. If we care about the rights of the Tibetan people, we have to do it and say, well, what is the most meaningful step we can take right now without really upsetting the international order? And the most meaningful step that we can take right now, we think, uh, especially given the motion, is to recognize the Dalai Lama. Yes. Madam, uh, the Chinese government has explicitly has a stance against the Dalai Lama's recognition. You making this baby step may be a baby step to you, but is a substantial step to the Chinese government. So yes, uh, the Chinese government will obviously not be thrilled with this move. That's what Tess told you in her first proposition speech, which you didn't ever rebut directly in your speech. Uh, Tess told you that the Chinese government does things that the West disagrees with on a fundamental principled level. And in some senses, we haven't pushed them on every single issue because we do have to work with them in the long term. But on these very important issues, such as the protection of human rights, we think it's important that the West pushes the Chinese government and says, you might not want to do this, but it's important. And if you want to maintain your relationship with the West, you will recognize human rights more. So. Uh, Getting on, and, and so, so we do think that this is a, a weird kind of contradiction that, that Op tries to force us into. Because yes, it might upset the Chinese government a little bit, but we don't think it will lead to the complete breakdown of Western relations with the Chinese. And why is that? Because we already see the Chinese government meeting with representatives of the Dalai Lama. We already see President Bush meeting directly with the Dalai Lama. So the important step is yes, there's political significance to this symbolic move, uh, but will it destroy relations? No. Uh, the pressure itself is worth it. So why do we think the pressure itself is worth it into my extension material? Uh, we think that this will lead to greater stability in the region uh, as a whole. So first, we think that when people are oppressed and people don't feel like they have any kind of uh, voice in their government or any kind of mechanism through which to get any redress to violations of rights, that's when people resort to protests in the streets. That one, that's when people resort to violence against maybe their Han Chinese neighbors. That's because when people, people need to feel like they have some kind of opportunity to have, have some kind of effect on their lives, lives and effect on the political system. Particularly when they're oppressed in both a political sense and a religious and cultural sense and when the government is denying the validity of their cultural identity. That's why it's so important for, the, for these Tibetan minorities to have some kind of validation of their identity as a cultural and religious uh, group that is distinct from, these, from the Han Chinese. 
Now, we hear this POI that the Chinese government is going to interpret this as a threat to their sovereignty because the Chinese government conceptualizes sovereignty as having some kind of ethnic homogeneity. Uh, and that's also the last argument that we heard from opposition. Now, this ignores the arguments that Tess made in her speech, where Tess told you that Western liberal democracies base their, the, the entire conception of what a political unit is uh, on the idea of us having shared values or a shared nationality. And we don't all have to have the same ethnicity, the same religion, the same cultural experiences, the same types of relationships with one another. So even if China, so, so as a Western liberal democracy, we don't accept this notion of sovereignty as requiring ethnic homo homogeneity. And that's why we think we should push for a conception of sovereignty which is based on nationality and not on homogeneity. So, uh, let's get directly into some rebuttal here. Madam, we hear, uh, actually, I'll take It's first. offensive to the Tibetan people to say that having a cup of coffee with the Dalai Lama in his religious capacity gives them any outlet for political expression. Uh, I think if the Chinese Communists, if, if the CCCP has a cup of coffee directly with the Dalai Lama and they engage in direct talk, that's a lot more articulation than if you have uh, some kind of web of like advisors meeting advisors meeting advisors because we don't want to go through the like taboo political thing of somehow recognizing him. Uh, international relations, especially on this level, is largely about symbolism. And I think the symbolism meeting with the Dalai Lama is important on that level because it gives validation to people as a cultural and religious entity, but also you get you do get kind of direct articulation when people have direct talks with one another and can actually have some kind of agreement. Uh, we think you can't have any kind of substantive agreement on moving forward or kind of political change in China or having any kind of direct way for the Dalai Lama to say, we don't think you should treat the people in this region in X manner if you have direct meetings and you can have a direct like agreement that you come out and both parties come out to the media and say, we've agreed on X policy. We think that's a lot more meaningful than backdoor meetings. So they say you get better outcomes on their side because we don't think they think absolute autonomy is going to be dangerous for China. The Dalai Lama, as we heard from second opposition, is a, is, is, uh, has already agreed that the Tibetans aren't demanding absolute autonomy. The Dalai Lama is actually a more moderate voice within the Tibetan policy. The, the Dalai Lama has advocated a middle way approach, which is China can retain sovereignty. What the Tibetan people need is a recognition of their cultural autonomy, which is what we think is important on a human rights level. Then we hear arguments that the violence, there's going to be more violence against Tibetans because the, the, there's going to be uh, violence if there's independence movements. We've already told you why this isn't analogous to an independence movement, and that's not what the Dalai Lama is going to demand. But moreover, we think you get more violence and more of this kind of clash between ethnicities if people feel like they need to resort to protests and violence in the streets to have their voices heard. They say they get to try to justify this the idea of the, 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 the government controls the media. Well, yes, the government controls the media. There is no recourse then for the Tibetans on their side of the house. On our side of the house, the Dalai Lama provides a recourse because there's at least the religious avenue for people to say we need our human rights protected. On our side of the house, we say yes, political. Th th there's like difficulties in the political arrangement, but the most important thing is protection of human rights and the ability for people to feel validated in their religious and cultural sense. That's what a government should be doing, and that's what Western liberal. Government should be pushing for. We're very proud to propose. So I think it's important to recognize that at this juncture, we, heard, we never heard why the recognition of the Dalai Lama as a religious leader will give him the kind of political clout that side proposition is proposing. There is no reason for the CCCP to sit down and have a cup of coffee with the Dalai Lama in order to negotiate towards more autonomy for the Tibetan region if the only context the West is recognizing him in is a religious one. Um, if they think that these gains do exist, then they have to accept that there is a political element to the Dalai Lama that is inherent in his symbolic significance to the Tibetan people. Um, and in that case, I think that dichotomy really undermines the case, Mr. Speaker. So I want to talk to you first about the symbolic significance of the Dalai Lama to the Tibetan people, how his place in their cultural narrative means that he is inherently entwined with an independent Tibetan region, um, regardless of what the West says, and regardless of what he says now about independence and that sort of thing, Mr. Speaker. Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about negotiation within a communist context, and I'm going to talk to you about harm. So constructive and refutation will be interwoven with those last two points of clash. 
First of all, though, Mr. Speaker, regarding the symbolic significance of the Dalai Lama, it's really important to recognize that throughout the struggle of the Tibetan region for independence, um, the Dalai Lama has been at the forefront as a leader um, and has been recognized as a leader in exile right up until 2004 when he basically gave away his leader in exile status to the Tibetan Autonomous Region Parliament. I think that's significant because it's not like the Tibetan Autonomous Region was like, whoa, we need a parliament, we need some more democracy. The Dalai Lama was like, here guys, why don't I give this authority to you, Mr. Speaker? So I think it's important to recognize that he still has this kind of political clout and this kind of, um, I guess, ability to direct the Tibetan people politically um, in the Tibetan Autonomous Region right now. Further though, Mr. Speaker, I think when you are a Tibetan person and when you have seen the Dalai Lama for years and years as um, the liberator of your people, Mr. Speaker, the symbol of his living in exile as the symbol of um, Chinese oppression of the region, I think regardless um, uh, of what he says now, I think those people still see him as a symbol for independence, Mr. Speaker. So I think that's really important. So I think basically that um, the intertwinedness of the Dalai Lama in the Tibetan Autonomous Region struggle for independence means that in the minds of people, which is what matters, Mr. Speaker, he will always be this symbol for independence, and he will always be this political figure as well as a religious figure. Um, no. We had two challenges to this from pop proposition. So the first thing is that they say that the Dalai Lama has renounced his claim to independence, so it really doesn't matter. So first of all, um, this cultural narrative exists for the CCCP as well, Mr. Speaker. So we recognize that as they've been sort of like trying to oppress him over the years, we think that it has this cultural significance for them as well. Um, but second of all, even if he has done this in, in recent past, they don't know that the Tibetan Autonomous Region Parliament will not continue their claims for independence in the future. So I still think that problem exists, and I still think that's pretty um, prevalent in the minds of the CCCP right now. The second thing they tell us is that he's not considered a religious figure. Um, in that case, we don't see how any of the political benefits or any of the human rights benefits for the Tibetan Autonomous Region that have been proposed stand. Go. Uh, does the Pope have any power to push for protection of human rights, even though he doesn't have any kind of political influence over like any autonomous region? I'm like, like, <laughs> like the regions he pushes. So I think the, the Pope's effect on human rights are kind of a wash. They're kind of negligible. I'm not actually sure that he does have any influence to push for human rights in like Christian African countries or Christian like Latin American countries or anything like that, Mr. Speaker. Moreover, though, if you're concerned about human rights, don't go and antagonize the CCCP into cracking down in the autonomous region. Like, use whatever political clout the West has to recognize, like, um, journalists for human rights or something like that, Mr. Speaker, right? There are other ways to get human rights that do not involve recognizing the Dalai Lama. <laughs> now, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to talk a little bit about negotiating with negotiation within the communist context. This is um, reconstruction of Vinay's material about why the state, the communist state, necessarily must reject negotiating with um, negotiating with the Dalai Lama. Um, so Vinay told you very clearly that power in a communist state, not in a Western liberal democracy like um, proposition seems to have like misconstrued, but in a communist state, stems from the state's ability to claim that it is correct all the time and knows exactly what the people want, right? That is how it resists claim for democracy, by claiming that it is a higher authority than the people that they experience some kind of false consciousness. Um, the response we got from proposition is that, well, in Western liberal democracies, we don't all have to be the same. We can have our own ideas, right, Mr. Speaker? That's why those countries espouse democracy. Um, we think that it is still a problem in a communist context when you negotiate with groups that want independence and that think that they know better than the central government what is best for their population. Recognize that China um, does have a lot of ethnic minorities, basically because it's like really big. Um, one particular region that's been a problem lately is the Xinjiang province with like the Muslim Uyghur minority rioting in the streets and that kind of thing, Mr. Speaker. Um, Taiwan as well is another is another region that the Chinese government wants to retain, needs to retain, Mr. Speaker. We think that they've been so um, like rabid basically about cracking down in these places because once one place separates, once one place has greater claims to autonomy, the rest of them do too, Mr. Speaker. So we think that in this Chinese state, if it does not want to lose its central authority, it cannot um, negotiate with a religious leader or that is a symbol of independence because we think it strengthens the independence movements elsewhere, Mr. Speaker. Um, lastly, about harms. So we had this idea from, from Proposition, first of all, that it's a liberal principle to recognize this religious leader because if you don't, um, there is a religious oppression in Tibet. So first of all, we think that um, antagonizing a communist government like this, they tend to be pretty reactionary when their central authority is challenged. So first of all, I think it's really important to note that in the Olympics example we get from Proposition, 
the, the chain of event goes something like this. So there are protests about um, the autonomy of Tibet. The Chinese government cracks down on hundreds of people. Many, many, like many people um, die. And then later, after the Olympics, the Chinese government is like, okay, well, maybe we'll talk with some um, Tibetan officials, right? Recognize that these talks have not happened yet. Recognize that the only actual concrete outcomes of these events are crackdowns, right? So we don't think that in any case, if the West gets any kind of gain, it may be some sort of like um, false promise that the government doesn't intend to follow through on, right? But what you do for sure get is this increased violence towards minorities. So the first harm we think we get is, um, is this harm to minorities in, in Tibet particularly, um, as the Chinese government has shown it's very willing to do. And second of all, when harm to, to minorities in other areas that are considering separating its Um Another thing to note is that generally in Tibet, people are allowed to practice their religion um, as long as they are not supporting like independence and the Dalai Lama while they are doing it. Recognize that there are monasteries, recognize that these people um, are allowed to be Buddhist, recognize that this kind of religious oppression doesn't exist to the same extent, Mr. Speaker. So what do we think is important in this round? We think this round is basically about how to move forward in Tibet and how to make the situation better for Tibetans. We think this undermines their negotiating power by antagonizing China in the long run, and we think it undermines the ability of other minorities um, to succeed in their, in their aims in the long term as well. We thank you. recognize the Dalai Lama because of the fact that he's a key figure for religious freedom. Thirdly, given the opposition are certain that this is going to have political consequences, I'm going to look at, if they're right, what those sorts of consequences would be and why we think they would be good too, but why it's important to recognize the Dalai Lama purely in a religious sense. And fourthly, I'm going to talk about China's response and again deal with some of the stuff we get from them. So let's get started. First opposition get up and they say to us, everything's fine in Tibet, you know, the Chinese government are trying really hard, they've even built them an airport. Great. We say actually this is complete nonsense for a couple of reasons. First of all, we see repeated, repeated oppression of these people, right? In August 2001, the Chinese government occupies ministry, monasteries and forces people to denounce the Dalai Lama. We see that they repeatedly imprison nuns and monks and those protesting for religious freedom. We see in 2009, when they lock up over a thousand people in the Tibetan region because they've been protesting to have religious rights, they still keep hundreds in custody despite continued international pressure to release these people. We see, for example, that Pasal Kayap, right, dies in custody in 2009, covered in blister burns and cigarette burns and bruises. The fact is that the Chinese government isn't treating these people well, and this is something that first opposition simply have to recognise. When the last speaker comically gets up and says, people can practice their religions in China, we think that they're living in a dreamland. We think that they should wake up and recognise the real world. We said that China is repeatedly interfering in the ability of Buddhists to practice their religion. We see, for example, in 1995, right, when they try and stop Buddhists being able to choose the second command of the Dalai Lama, where they interfere and say that it has to be a different person and imprison the boy that has been chosen. We say that's not a situation where Buddhists are getting any no. sort of religious freedom. And secondly, we want to talk about what China means by this integration that they talk about, right? We saw in 2009 that the local authorities in the Tibetan region renewed the patriotic education campaign. What is this? This is a system where they get Tibetans to participate in collective criticism campaigns of the Dalai Lama and sign written denunciations against him. It's a situation where Tibetan members of the Chinese Communist Party are forced to remove their children from Tibetan schools where they're being taught about Buddhism. We say this isn't a situation where they have any sort of religious freedom. So we think it's pretty offensive for first opposition. No thank you to get up and assert that. No thanks. Okay, what do we want to talk about next? Why do we think the Dalai Lama is so important? 
Because we think the first proposition recognises this, but didn't necessarily look at the explicit reasons why this is the case, right? The fact is that for Buddhists, the Dalai Lama is the most important person in their religion. He's their religious leader. The fact <coughs> is that in 2005, right, he offers to stand down. He said that he was willing to get rid of the process of reincarnation, of having a Dalai Lama, if that's what the Buddhist people wanted. And he got an incredible mandate from those people, that they, he was the person that they wanted to lead their religion. We think that when you have a religious leader like that, we think it's important that the West recognises that he is that religious leader. And I'll take you in a sec, Chris. Now, the opposition say that, like, what we're doing is no more than the status quo. But that's simply not true. Because in the status quo, what we do is we go to China and we say, you know, you should protect human rights, you should try and be nice to these people. But ultimately, we sacrifice a lot of these goals in order to get the kind of economic deals we want. But we see a situation now where China basically is incredibly tied into a lot of economic deals with the West. A situation where the Chinese cannot simply ignore what the West calls on them for anymore. And we say in this kind of situation, we think this sort of policy can work. Now, what we get from these guys, and I'll take you one second, Chris, sorry, is that other minorities are going to be suppressed, right? That that's going to be the consequence of this. We say, actually, what we think this will do is benefit the religious freedom of these people, because it says for the first time that the West does take religious freedom seriously, that the West cares about Chinese people and their ability to choose what kind of a religious life they want to lead. Go on. The West relies on China as its most important strategic partner. How does sending the message that their behaviour in Tibet and ownership of Tibet is not legitimate help them come to the negotiating table when it strips them of face and they need to save face in international relations? Okay, well first of all we think that like the West has been telling China for a pretty long time that its behaviour in Tibet is unacceptable, right? So we don't think that all of a sudden, after saying them for years, what you're doing is fine, we're suddenly going, actually we have a bit of a problem with this. But what we say it does do is it shows that we care. It shows that it's not just empty rhetoric. That actually we do believe that the Dalai Lama has an important role to play and that he deserves some sort of recognition. What I want to talk about now is the response to what we get from these guys that this will be seen as political. Because what we say is we think that's fine. We think it's important that you don't explicitly endorse the Dalai Lama as an independent leader. First of all, because he's not a political leader. We've already heard that he's given up his right, no thank you, to be that explicit political leader. But what we say is that recognising him as a religious leader and giving him some authority and a sense that he's a legitimate person, that he's not a person that the Chinese government can just denounce all the time and force others to denounce, is important if we do want any sort of political solution for Tibet. Because we think that in order for its people to have religious freedom, we probably do need some kind of autonomy to guarantee their rights. That was basically something that the first opposition conceded when they said that it would probably be okay for them to have autonomy like Hong Kong, like Macau. We say that opening up discussions with the Dalai Lama as a religious leader is key to this, first of all, because he's one of the voices that's specifically not calling for independence. We say there are small parts of the Tibetan community that have made those calls. We think that ultimately independence is something that's incredibly unrealistic here. And we think negotiating with those sorts of groups is a guarantee that nothing will improve. But we say when we have the Dalai Lama, who gets up in 1987 and 1988, advocates the middle way approach, says that Tibet is willing to give up its claim for independence if it can be given genuine autonomy. We say in this sort of situation, we think there's a chance that the Tibetans are going to get the kind of internal self-determination that we think that they need. We say he's incredibly important as a figurehead. We saw that when he was given the Nobel Peace Prize. We saw that when people rallied around him in a lot of protests across the West prior to the Olympics. And we think recognising him and showing that the West has faith in him is important. Finally, what will China's response be? Because I'll get up and they go, China's going to be really irritated. Like, we happily irritate China lots of the time when we tell them, right, that what they've done with the Uyghurs is incredibly terrible, that it's something we can't tolerate. We irritate them all the time when we undermine their actions by criticising their human rights record. But what we say is that, first of all, China currently cracks down on monks and nuns. We think it's hard to see how this is going to get worse. We think, for example, that when we recognise the Dalai Lama, it's a lot harder for them to launch the patriotic education campaign and force others to denounce him. We think it's a lot harder to brand him as a revolutionary and suppress Buddhism and their support for him if we've recognised him. And we say, ultimately, because of the economic links we have with China, they can't turn around and walk away. We have to find a way, firstly, to guarantee religious freedom for the people of Tibet, and secondly, to put them on a road where ultimately some kind of political representation is possible in the long term. First Prop told you we had to take baby steps. We agree. We think this is the best way to do it. For all these reasons, I beg you to propose. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, the conceit at the heart of the entire government case is that Barack Obama having coffee with the Dalai Lama in his capacity as Richard Gere's spiritual advisor and not as the leader of the Tibetan people produces no benefit for Tibet. It produces no benefit for China. And most critically, ladies and gentlemen, we think it actually makes things worse for the West's cooperation with China and its capacity to get China to act on a plethora of important strategic issues. What these guys want to do is prejudice the relationship with one of the two superpowers who holds the economic fate of the West in its hands and as well as its most important strategic interests for a pretty insignificant message towards the Dalai Lama. There's four points of rebuttal I want to make before I get to extension, which is built on international cooperation. First, it's a spurious distinction between the religious and political elements of the Dalai's leadership. Number one, because before the invasion, he was the political leader of Tibet. Two, for that reason, China interprets him as the political leader of Tibet. But three, like it completely marginalizes the struggle of the Tibetan people because they perceive him as their political and religious leader. Like it was a theocracy before China went in. The second point of rebuttal is on the question of recognition. We think it is perfectly appropriate to only recognize countries in certain, in, in certain instances. Like in a diplomatic sense, the world, rec like the world recognizes all sorts of unsavory regimes and doesn't recognize people who might have a legitimate claim to leadership because it, it, they might not have sovereignty. But further than that, we think it's perfectly fine that the West doesn't recognize countries, even if they do have sovereignty, if it's not in their strategic interest, which is the why the West doesn't recognize Taiwan. The third point of rebuttal is about practical, ref practical effects. We say, one, the problem here is that China doesn't respond to international pressure in the neat way that the government bench want to pretend, because of the Confucian tradition of saving face. They don't want to lose respect on an international plane by seeming to cow to international and specifically Western pressure. And the example of the Olympics is like a disastrous one for the government because when the West started to agitate about Tibet, it led to a crackdown in Tibet and the movement towards autonomy was set back because of empty Western rhetoric. The second thing we say is we don't need to speculate about what China will do in this instance because even now China is increasingly exerting pressure on Western nations to not meet with the Dalai Lama and responding with a crackdown in the, in the, on the streets of Lhasa. Like when the Dalai Lama uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize, Chinese troops went into Tibet to quell any potential unrest. But the third thing we say is like China makes it very clear there are direct repercussions for the West when they try and deal with the Dalai Lama. So the fourth thing that we'd say is with respect to the closing government's extension about autonomy. There is an enormous tension at the heart of this argument, ladies and gentlemen. Because on the one hand, they gave us like three minutes from the World Guide about why things are not rosy in Tibet at the moment. And on the other hand, they acknowledge that the West has been telling China for the last 30 years that, this, uh, that, that, that Tibet is like, it, their control over Tibet is not legitimate. So there is clearly no relation between Western rhetoric and practical effects for the improvement of the people of Tibet. Like, showing the West cares is a pretty empty rhetorical message. The patriotic education campaign this year had nothing to do with Western pressure. The fact is that they suppress these people whether the West acts or not. Okay, interesting. So you can see there's no relation between Western pressure and effects on the streets of Tibet. You will probably lose. This brings us... <laughs> brings us to what we want to contribute by way of extension as to why this prejudices China's cooperation. We think Tibet is important to China for three, years, three reasons. First, it's important to its perceived territorial integrity. Like there is a nationalistic fear of dismemberment that applies to the Chinese government that dates back to like the 1890s. We say second, like the political control of the communist regime is built on the cultural integration and the integrity of the one China policy that elides the enormous differences between the many peoples of China in favor of a unifying message that all Chinese people are the same. The third thing we say as to why it matters is that the strategic buffer Tibet offers to India. Like when Manmohan Singh visited border provinces with Tibet recently, the Chinese government withdrew representatives from, Mum, uh, from, uh, withdrew representatives from New Delhi because it perceived it as a slight on its control over that region. So we think any movement towards recognizing more Tibetan autonomy on the part of the West will necessarily offend the Chinese government. And the government bench acknowledged this 
when they said that obviously the Chinese government will not be thrilled. Like if they already don't like meeting, meeting with the Dalai Lama in any capacity, we think it's very realistic to assume that there will be repercussions for meeting him in a slightly more official but not that official capacity. So why does this threaten Chinese cooperation and why is that important? We think China is and can be a credible strategic partner on a host of important strategic issues. Like first, in terms of issues, we think often the strategic benefit to China in a whole range of settings, like on climate change, on dealing with North Korea, and dealing with, and, and dealing with Iran, is not actually that clear. So we have to rely on a certain altruism to get them to act, to get them to believe that cooperating with the West is both credible, but in, in, in essence, like it is, is the product of like the West doing things that China also wants. So we think in the instance where China effectively controls the pattern of world trade and has the economic power to wreak violence on every Western economy, that actually like you can rely on it being in their self-interest to a point, but there's lots of other issues that are not on their self-interest where we just need their bilateral cooperation to get a good outcome. But the second thing we say is that Chinese cooperation within strategic institutions like the United Nations is built on a continuing and abiding respect for the internal sovereignty of nations and the right of every nation to control everything within its own borders. So we think like number one, you're prejudicing their goodwill and incentives to cooperate in forums like the United Nations. But number two, like it's an attack on their entire worldview and modus operandi within those institutions to suggest that China lacks sovereignty within its own borders. So we think att like attacking that by this policy, which says that like in some way the Dalai Lama is like a sovereign threat to the Chinese government, we think actually prejudices their likelihood to cooperate in a meaningful way within those institutions. We think not only is that bad for the West, it's bad for the entire international community. Ms. Mr. Speaker, because this policy, policy is no good for Tibet, it's no good for China, and it's no good for the West, it's not a policy we should pursue. Thank you. 
And, and what we said, and then we had this idea from the opposition speaker just then that, oh, we don't need to act here, like, it's fine for us not to recognise the autonomy of the people if it's not in our strategic interest. Oh, like, for example, we don't recognise Taiwan. And we said, like, firstly, the US absolutely does recognise Taiwan. There's a specific US statute on the book saying that they will bomb China if it ever attacks Taiwan. We say, moreover, in the case of Taiwan, like, it's more legitimate for us perhaps to question their claim to sovereignty. Again, they're making an entirely different claim to sovereignty than Tibet, or Tibet once, ladies and gentlemen, or the Dalai Lama is agitating for is autonomy within a federated China in the same way as Hong Kong and Macau have that, as recognised by the first opposition speaker. And moreover, like, even if we didn't recognise Taiwan, who cares, ladies and gentlemen? When we're seeing a region which is being oppressed as brutally as the Tibetan region, we think it's absolutely imperative on us to act in favour of that region, even if it compromises our strategic interests, because we're nice, ladies and gentlemen, because we think it's in accordance with our political and liberal views, as the first proposition said. We think there's a duty on us as responsible actors in the international community to act in this manner. No, thank you. Secondly, ladies and gentlemen, we say that the Dalai Lama is the key figure that we need to be focusing on in this debate. Why is this? Three reasons. Firstly, we think the Dalai Lama is a key figurehead for the Tibetan people. We see that it's a key, he's a key figurehead in the West. I'll take you in the second, second speaker. We see that he's a key figurehead in the West, ladies and gentlemen, because of the way... <laughs> No, the first half. We see that he's a key figurehead in the West, ladies and gentlemen, because of the way that he's awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, because of the way that political discussion of Tibet focuses around the Dalai Lama, who is a recognised individual. And we see, moreover, that he's the key figurehead in Tibet because of his religious importance. For that reason, ladies and gentlemen, he's the symbolic figure which uh, represents Tibetan religious freedom. He's the one we need to focus on. Okay, so the question is not if things are bad, it's who has the better prospects for progress. Can you explain the link for how, if you, for example, okay, okay, okay. I've already said, okay, okay, okay. I've already said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be dealing specifically with the causal link of my final point, so forgive me if I leave it to all then rather than disrupt my speech. Okay, secondly, ladies and gentlemen, we say that the Dalai Lama is the key figure to focus on precisely because he's given up his political power and is now therefore a religious leader rather than officially a political leader. He therefore no longer presents the threat that he used to by being the sort of recognised leader in exile. What this means, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, is by specifically recognising the Dalai Lama as a religious leader in the West, actually that poses less of a threat to China, because we're not saying to China, we think that the Tibetan Autonomous Region Parliament should be a sovereign parliament, we're saying we recognise the Dalai Lama as a religious leader rather than a political one, a religious leader who agitates for a moderate political settlement. And that actually presents less of a threat to China and presents more of a realistic prospect for a, a, an acceptable settlement in the region. Thirdly, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why the Dalai Lama is the key thing that we need to focus on is because he wants a moderate solution. We think that, like, it's the sort of argument from the opposition that what we're saying is that China lacks sovereignty within its borders isn't true, because what the Dalai Lama specifically wants, ladies and gentlemen, is not a reduction of sovereignty. He wants a Quebec-style sort of independent autonomous state within China. Um, I think <laughs> we think the opposition should completely understand this. Um, okay, finally, ladies and gentlemen, let's deal with this issue of like, how this will achieve, how this will actually work, how these objections of the opposition about, oh, China will be a bit irritated, just don't stand. What we say, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so firstly, just dealing with this key causal link, <coughs> the specific thing which we do by recognising the Dalai Lama as the leader of the, of the religious, of the, as the religious leader of the Tibetan people, says that actually, when you oppress the Tibetans in a religious sense, when you arrest monks and nuns, as they have been doing, when you force monks and nuns to denounce the Dalai Lama, that's a completely illegitimate thing for them to be doing. It becomes much more difficult for them to say we're just controlling a region, we're just doing our job as the sort of sovereign like leaders of our country. We're saying actually this is an illegitimate thing for you to do because you're oppressing the Tibetans in a religious sense. We said that actually it's much more difficult for China to do that. The opposition would come up and told us, oh, but China will retaliate, and this is really problematic. They completely misunderstood Joe's point of information, which is that China just retaliates in any case. We see an awful lot of oppression um, in, in, the, in the sort of status quo. So what we actually need to do is change this. We need to actually take a realistic action rather than like all we've had of the opposition is oppression which we recognise on proposition, which the opposition have just like disgracefully tried to, tried to downgrade, we need to take some kind of action. We see that by recognising the Dalai Lama as a moderate religious figure who can agitate for this for a sort of a greater human rights in Tibet, we can actually prevent this. We can say, actually, no, as the West, we do support Tibet in a very real sense, rather than in the sort of lip service sense which we have done so far. And we think that actually it's going to make it far, far harder for China to retaliate because it has much greater political consequences. Moreover, what we see um, is that China has 
has a very important symbiotic relationship with the US and with the West as a whole. Like, given that half, like, the majority of their foreign reserves are held in dollars, we don't think it's going to be in their interest to completely withdraw from the US, as the last speaker tried to imply. Because relationships between China and the West are so important and so key, we don't think it's going to be possible for them to withdraw, as the opposition has tried to claim. We say, moreover, that even if we do expend the political capital in doing this, it's absolutely worthwhile because of the reasons that we've given you on the proposition and the dreadful state that the better the people are in. And so, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the Dalai Lama is absolutely the key figure we need to focus on. It's the only plausible solution at the moment for achieving greater human rights people in Tibet. For all these reasons, I stand very proud of the proposition. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the debate and coach within me has two questions for the closing government. Firstly, if you think human rights are so awful in Tibet and the crisis is so large, why are you so coy about the political impacts of this and about China's potential reaction to this? Secondly, how are you saving the Tibetan people when you've gone, gone to lengths to say, firstly, this is only a minimal imposition on China that they won't really mind, and secondly, the Dalai Lama isn't really agitating for all that much. It is strangely dissonant, and it means that the closing gov have given the opening gov a run for their donors. I'll ask two questions in this speech. Firstly, can the political benefits claim accrue? And secondly, why does this cripple international cooperation? To the first, I'll deal with the closing government first. We heard from closing government that they won't backlash because we've stated our disapproval before. And yet when I asked the POI about that, they said, well, that was just empty rhetoric. This will be worse. So obviously that was of limited probative value. Chris also showed you that China doesn't react to Western pressure because China needs to save face and needs to be seen to be acting autonomously. We also, talk, but we also say that the scale of the insult here is different. There is a big difference in China's mind between telling them that what they're doing is wrong and acting to undermine their sovereignty to try and make them change their behaviour. You lose face either way, but it's much worse when, when China loses face because the premise of the action is the illegitimacy of their sovereignty as opposed to the comity between nations and their ability to comment upon each other. We heard that China is economically tied to the West. That is both cookie cutter analysis and blatantly untrue for this reason. The stimulus package that China put into place has done more to stimulate Southeast Asian and, and uh, Western, Amer uh, Western American economies than their own government stimulus packages. Secondly, the demand that China represents is the only area of the world where demand is growing and where economic success is continuing. And thirdly, America, uh, China holds one trillion US dollars in foreign currency reserves and its actions with regards to its currency can cripple Western trade and cripple Western economies. What do we hear from the opening? We know that religion and politics are separate. Firstly, the closing knife them when they said it's okay if it's seen as political. But secondly, by the opening government's own arguments about the political outcomes, they knife it themselves. Then we heard that whether or not there's a separate parliament, he's sorry, we said whether or not there's a separate parliament, he is seen as the leader by both Tibetans and by China. So when China is trying to get people in re-education camps to denounce him, it's because they see him as a threat. So in debating land, it may not really matter what the outcome is, because China has demonstrated they see him as a leader. Lastly, we say that if he's agitating for religious freedom, and if the point of this proposal is religious freedom, that forgets that religious freedom is a political crusade, and that the, and that the Dalai Lama symbolises, at the very least, the political crusade for religious freedom. That's why China will care. Then we hear that he's given up on autonomy, so it's okay. okay. We say firstly that, the West, that China never concedes when the West pressures it. We told you about why, when China cracked down in Tibet before the Olympics, and then the West got on their high horse, China left the troops on the streets until April 2009, so it wasn't seen to withdraw as a response to Western action. So it actually got worse because of the Western pressure. We say, then, secondly, that if autonomy is still seen as a separatist agitation and is seen as a separatist, a step towards separatism by the separatists, that's more of a reason to, for China to send troops into the streets to keep Tibet down. So even if the Dalai Lama or the parliament isn't ag agitating for complete sovereignty, this is a win for the people that will. They will come out on the streets and protest, and even if they don't, China will be afraid enough to roll in the tanks. We say, finally, that on, on the issue of whether it helps human rights and the right to practice, 
We say firstly, Tibetans already know who their religious leader is, and like opening government telling them again is unlikely to make them any more or less books. <laughs> Secondly, we'd say, given China's record on human rights that I explained above, it's unlikely to help. Finally, we would say that going to pains to point out how unpolitical this is limits, in like a debating theory way, the extent of the benefits you can claim. If you claim something is uncontroversial, you can't also claim it is large and helpful when there is controversy. To the second issue of the debate, and that is international cooperation. We heard scant response to our extension. I will take that as a compliment on my and Chris's behalf. <laughs> to the issue of rec recognition sovereignty, actually, I'll take the closing first. I think you should take it as an idea that we don't care that much about it because we think you actually need to do something to help the Tibetan people. You have also no solution on the opposition. And yet again, we hear from closing government that they exist in debating world and not the real world. The idea that we will just spite China is madness. What China has shown in international relations is that they are willing to cut off both of our noses to save their face. We saw this from China in the WTO when they filibustered the entire Doha round because of intellectual property issues that were important only to them, even though that hurt both of our trade interests. We see that with China not being willing to take a stand for human rights in Sudan because they don't want to undermine the perception of the inviolability of sovereignty. We see that in Copenhagen, where China will be one of the hardest hit countries as a result of desertification. Yeah, that sounds like a happy meal, but you, you get what I mean, as a result of climate change. when they'll be one of the worst hit by rising sea levels, but we're willing to cut off their own nose to save face and not be seen as caving to the West. So that's why their cooperation is so important. But we also heard that, well, even if it's not, we heard that, well, like we do recognise Taiwan. Not the case. What that illustrates with Taiwan is that there are things you can do that sit outside of recognition that can still help people. The fact that we won't recognise Taiwan as a separate legitimate actor shows exactly how crucial recognition is as a political step. Recognition of a right to sovereignty or of sovereignty is a huge step in the international sphere. It sits well below a discussion of co uh, correctness of, of, of uh, invasion or of occupation. But we say secondly that China cares. Chris gave you a number of reasons why Tibet and control over Tibet and the perception of righteousness of control over Tibet is crucial to China's place within the region. He told you that Mama Han Singh just going to the border regions between China and India around Tibet was reason for China to withdraw uh, its diplomats and we heard no response to that. Lastly, we told you that China is crucial. The thing to remember here is that we rely on China's altruism, but we also rely on their willingness to make mutually beneficial decisions, which as I explained earlier, they often won't do. So we're dealing with an actor here who in many situations is willing to make mutually detrimental decisions, so long as those decisions are so long, or to avoid decisions that are seen as being forced upon them by the West. So we told you that respect and cooperation is key to continuing economic cooperation. Negotiations about exchange rate movements and about the holdings of US foreign currency are rely on China and the US having mutual respect and a relationship that avoids some issues in order to keep the rest on board. But secondly, we said that international institutions are based on respective sovereignty, like ASEAN, like the UN Security Council, and that China's willingness to work within them relies on us maintaining the utmost respect for their sovereignty we beg to oppose.